Every day, you are surrounded by data. In the newspaper, on TV, on the radio, on your smartphone, on your smart watch. In fact, if you printed out all the data you consume in a day, those stacks of paper would fill up 34 pickup trucks. The problem is that much of this data is either out of context, misleading, or just plain wrong. Our big idea is that you can become a better consumer of all of the little data in your everyday life. And the good news is you don't need any specialized training in math or statistics to become a better consumer of data. We're going to show you how tonight, and by the time we're done, we hope you'll never look at the headlines or data in the same way again. My name is Mike Gluck. I'm a writer. And my name is John Johnson. I'm a professional statistician and an economist. In my day job, I run a data-driven company where I help explain to people how to take complicated data sets and make sense of them. And in my job, I do something similar. I take complex topics and try to make them easy for anybody to understand. Now, John and I met 25 years ago in high school, as you can see by this lovely photo here. <laughs> and since then, We've gone off, we have had our successful careers, but about three years ago, we came together again to work on a new project. And what we did is we wrote a book called Every Data, the hidden misinformation in the little data you consume every day. Now, there's lots of different types of data that affects the decisions you make. And every day, whether you read the newspaper, whether you look at the internet, you see data that influences you. You use this data to make decisions. When you want to decide where should we go for dinner, you read a restaurant review. When you're thinking about what car you should buy or where to send your kids to college, you look at the rankings. But there's a lot of misinformation in those headlines. So how can you figure out what they really mean? Well, tonight we're going to show you something, some of the triggers, or what we call the tells of data. Now, anybody who's ever played poker knows that if you're against someone that happens to have good cards and they start to be wiggling in their seat, that's a tell that maybe you should fold. Or if you ever had a teenager who's lying to you, you know, the way they're talking or the way they're looking at you, something's probably up. So the same is true with data. There are triggers, and you can learn them, and we're going to show them to you. So let's get started. The first trigger a study of who. You see all headlines all the time that have the word you or your in them. But what does that really mean? Who are these studies about? Let's take a look. The first headline, are you hungry? Best to eat first and shop later, study finds. Now, when I read this headline, I might think, OK, if I'm starving, I probably shouldn't go to the grocery store because I'm going to rack up a huge bill. Right? Well, Mike, you might think that, but if the headline were a little more accurate, what it actually should say is, are 89 undergraduates hungry? Best to eat first and shop for binder clips, etc. later, study finds. Because it turns out, the majority of psychology research done in the US is done on undergraduates for beer money. So you have to, <laughs> so you have to ask yourself, are you like an undergraduate? Now, you don't often see college students out on a Friday night shopping for office supplies. But in this case, that's what they did. They took a bunch of undergraduates who were hungry, they put a bunch of binder clips in front of them, and they counted how many they took. And that's how they studied how much they would shop for. <laughs> so the question's to ask here. Anytime you see in the news something that talks about a new study, you should pause and think and ask yourself, does that study really apply to me? And the other thing you want to do is you want to step back and always wonder, what does it mean when something says you? Is it really about you or is it about something else? OK, let's move on to the next trigger, the average American. Now, averages, you might know, can be a little bit misleading. My friend John here is about six feet tall. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but our average height is five foot nine, which is great for me. Mm. Not so good for me. <laughs> so let's take a look at averages in the headlines. 
the average American household owes $90,336. How do you compare? Well, if we fix this headline to be a little bit less misleading, what should it actually say? Should actually say the average American household with debt owes $130,922. How do you compare? See, because when they calculated the original average, they included all the households that had no debt at all. In fact, that was about 40% of those households. So that might give you a very different picture. You started with 90,000, but when you take out all the zeros, the average goes up by about $40,000. So when you see a headline like this, you want to ask, who is in the average? And the second question to ask, are you average? Because what happens if it happened to be the case that you bought a new car today? And so you just racked up a bunch of debt. How would you compare then? Or what if you just inherited a large amount of money and it paid off all your credit cards? You might not be average, but what does it really mean to you? Let's take a look at another trigger. One out of five. You see headlines all the time. One out of five doctors, four out of five dentists, nine out of 10 parents. What does it mean? Now, this one caught our eye because of, you know, <laughs> one in five CEOs are psychopaths, study finds. Now, John, we all know John is a CEO. I've known John 25 years. I can assure you, he is not a psychopath. <laughs> but what should this headline actually say, John? Well, I was really interested in this when people started to look at me funny in the hallways where I work. So I did a little research, and what it actually should say is one in five supply chain professionals or psychopaths study of 261 people finds. Because they didn't actually look at CEOs at all. They looked at senior management professionals in the supply chain industry at companies that had over $50 million in revenues. That's a pretty specific group. Maybe CEOs are like that, but maybe they aren't. And they also only looked at 261 people, right? That's right. So they looked at a fairly small sample. And then, how did they define psychopath? Self-reported behavior. So they asked people about their behavior. <laughs> I don't know how many of you would like to admit that you're a psychopath. <laughs> but that's something else you need to be aware of. How was the data collected? So anytime you see four out of five, nine out of 10, just think to yourself, what's who's making up that sample and how were they selected? We all love rankings. So let's talk about where do you rank? This headline caught our eye because, hey, we love Buffalo. We love great news about Buffalo. Buffalo ranked third best food city worldwide by National Geographic. Right? Well, this, this made a lot of sense to us, because if you think about the great foods in the city of Buffalo, the amazing ethnic foods, all of the tremendous restaurants that are here, pierogies, pizza, so many great things. So surely this study must have looked at the breadth of amazing foods in the city of Buffalo. Right, Mike? Not quite. They didn't look at the restaurants. They didn't look at any of the foods that John just mentioned. They only looked at one food. You might be able to guess what it is chicken wings. So if we get out our red pen and correct to this headline, what it should actually say, based on one iconic dish, Buffalo named a top 10 food city worldwide by National Geographic. See, because what this study was trying to do was not to rank the quality of the food, but to find cities where there was a food that was associated with it in an iconic way. So, Bologna, Italy, pasta bolognese. Louisville, Kentucky, the hot brown sandwich. Buffalo, New York, chicken wings. So what's the lesson we can learn here? Let's say you eat wings for the next 20 years. One day, you might need a cardiologist. <laughs> so you look at the rankings. Well, what questions should you be asking when you're looking at a ranking of doctors? How were the doctors selected? What was the criteria by which they were ranked? What if it, you were looking at a list of top universities because it's about time to send your kids off to college? What's the criteria by which a school is ranked in the top 10? And does that matter to you and your children? All right. So. One of our favorites. You can be smarter, richer, healthier, and sexier. 
You see headlines like this all the time when you're going through the grocery store checkout line. Here's one. Everyone loves Starbucks. We love Starbucks. Starbucks increases neighborhood and home values. Now, when I read this, I might think, okay, great. I'm shopping for a house. Let me find a neighborhood where there's a Starbucks. Buy a house there. Prices go up. Everyone's happy, right? Well, you might think that. But in fact, if you actually corrected the headline, it probably should read like this. Neighborhood and home values increase the number of Starbucks. <laughs> because think about it. Starbucks strategically places their stores. And where would they strategically place them? In neighborhoods that had high home values with growing populations where they thought the stores would thrive. So you see a relationship in the data but it's probably not working the way the headline represents it. Here's another one of our favorites. Speaking of relationships. <laughs> Grilled cheese lovers have more sex and are better people, <laughs> according to a survey. So you're probably already asking some questions about this. Who are these people who love grilled cheese? And are they really having more sex? Well, if we correct the headline, what it should actually say. <laughs> Grilled cheese lovers say they have more sex and are better people, according to a dating website survey for National Grilled Cheese Day. <laughs> so when you're confronted with something like this, you might want to ask yourself, is this truly scientific research? If I really wanted to quantify someone's sex life, would I trust what they were seeing on an online dating website? <laughs> Probably not. And so finally, in the spirit of TEDx making people smarter, we have one other headline for you. Have a beer? It's good for your brain. <laughs> well, we took a closer look. I see the word you, and I ask, well, I wasn't in this study. And it turns out the study wasn't done on men, wasn't done on women, wasn't done on college undergrads, even though that would have been the perfect audience <laughs> for a study on beer. In fact, if we correct this headline, have 28 <laughs> kegs of beer, it's good for your brain if you're like a young mouse. <laughs> because this study was done on 25 mice. And when we looked at it and determined how much beer you'd have to drink to be happy, it was 28 kegs. Now, Mike and I, no. we like beer, but if we were to drink that much beer, I'm pretty sure we would be passed out on the floor, and that would not be good for our brain. The amount of data in your life is only going to increase. And over that time, you'll continue to be confronted with headlines that make use of data things that you will incorporate to make decisions in your life. But if you look for these triggers, you can be better than average. In fact, you can be the one in a million person that knows how to interpret the data in the headlines so it makes better decisions for you. And the good news is you don't need a PhD. You, I've never taken a statistics course. All you need is a red pen. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, we hope you will never look at the headlines the same way again when you think about every data. Thank you very much. <laughs>